Pulitzer Prize, but a number of other prizes, including the Los Angeles Book Prize, which is really, I think it was almost more of a literary prize. So, I mean, they're both literary prizes, but, you know, again, kudos. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, you trained as a historian at University of Texas and at University of Michigan. And for people who are not historians, you, should, you need to know that those are considered extremely top universities in the study of history. Universities somewhat specialized, and these are two great universities to have studied history at. And I'm, I'm making that point partly because history is a very specific kind of training. We're not journalists, we're not memoirists, we're not polemicists. And so there's a way in which you handle evidence there are parameters and, and rules, and there's a striving for objectivity uh, on, on trying to present a historical story. And yet, you start out on page one by saying, this is a deeply personal book. And I was wondering if you could tell us about how being a historian, but also this being such a personal book, complicated it or enhanced your writing. How did those things, did they butt up against each other or not? Actually, they didn't butt up against each other that much. So just by way of background, the book, as you can maybe tell from the title that was up there a minute ago, is A History of Cuba. And it covers more than 500 years from before the arrival of Columbus, pretty much to the present, to the election of Joe Biden. And it focuses a lot on the history of the relationship between Cuba and the US. I was born in Cuba. My family on both sides is all Cuban. So in some ways, I feel like the book is me. It's this, this strange hybrid of Cuba and the US, this sometimes conflictual, complicated, uh, rich history between the two countries that I feel like, like my family embodies, my community embodied. So that, that's part of it. But I think it's also that, you know, I trained as a historian, as you said, and I started working, well, actually, I began as an English major in college writing on Victorian literature in the 19th century. I wrote my thesis on a literary critic named Walter Pater, who probably, I would think, m most of you have not heard of. And then I finished, and I, at some point I realized, you know, I'm from this, this place that has so deeply marked me. Cuba was just always present in the way I was growing up, the way my parents talk. Uh, when my mother and I left Cuba, I was an infant of 10 months. Uh, I left a brother, we left a brother behind, her son. So anyway, Cuba, and we left her parents and her family, never, in, in many cases, she never saw many of them again. So it was just always there. And I felt like I knew nothing about it other than these family stories. And so I just began researching it and discovered that it was a history that I just loved. There's just so much to be fascinated by in that history and so many fascinating links to the history of, of the US. Um, that, to me, it just felt like a natural thing to do. And sometimes I'd be, I, I loved writing this book. Uh, you know, and I would be writing it sometimes and think, really, the, it's not so abstract. This is the history that explains why I'm writing in New York City, in some sense. Right. right, and not um, and not in Cuba. Yeah, and I love that idea. You said you, you she knew all these stories, but she didn't know much about it. Yeah, and which is a great place I think to start as a historian, where you don't really know much about something, and yeah. you say, but you know, I really want to know more about yeah. this, and that maybe that's the how the personal story doesn't butt up against the story that you're coming to find yeah. out because you don't know that right. element of it. And if and I could just say one yeah, more thing, sure. sorry. And the personal, sometimes the personal gives you different questions and a different perspective. So if you read, you know, in, if you read about the Cuban Revolution of 1959 in history books or political science books, it's, it's usually a story that's in which people's behavior is codified. People are in boxes. The wealthy did not support the revolution. The poor did. Right? I came from a poor family that left. Most of our neighbors were poor and had left. So in a sense, the personal experience, it doesn't show that the history that's been told is false, but it shows that maybe there's different questions that need to be asked. So sometimes the personal can be a kind of blessing. It can point you in, it can point you in different directions. Right, or it's a lodestar, if you yes. will. You're like, how come I'm not seeing that thing that right. I know in all these accounts? Right. And that sort of brings me to a question of, you know, when immigrants come to another country or go to another country, they often have very different ideas about their fatherland, motherland. You know, they don't all agree as to why they left, what this is like, yeah. and all of that. And 
was the interpretation that you came to have of the Cuban Revolution of 1959, we'll get to the others in a minute, mm -hmm. uh, was that the received version that, you know, the version you came to, was it the one that you inherited or was that one that you found yourself blazing differently from the immigrant community from which you'd, into it, which you'd been born? It wasn't the one I inherited, just like it wasn't the one that I encountered when I started traveling to Cuba. I, I first went back to Cuba in 1990 to begin doing dissertation research. And after that, I went pretty much about once a year on average to work in libraries and archives. And there's kind of an official story of what the Cuban Revolution is that you encounter in Havana. And then there's an exile version of what the Cuban Revolution is. And you realize, you know, the, the more you dig deep into the history and the more you look around you as you're there and the more you talk to people, you realize just how, how inadequate those those very, um, those glosses, those generalizations from above, they just don't capture the lived experience of someone, you know, confronting that really profound transformation in the moment. So I don't think it's either what I received or what I encountered. And I took from both. Each, I, I used each to question the other, but I think I, I, what I produced was something uh, in the in more in in the middle, something that was more attuned to change over time. People talk about the Cuban Revolution as if it's one thing, you know. Uh, it came to power in 1959. I was writing in 2020. I finished it in 2021. You can't write about the Cuban Revolution in 1959 as if it was the same thing that existed in 19. 76 or 1980 or you know 1990 much less 2021 so part of what I th so I think I use that perspective to question both the received wisdom in the exile community and the received uh, propaganda in Havana and of course revolutions become different things we can't speak of the American Revolution of 1776 as right. being the same sometimes some of the same people many but many different people 20 years later right. 40 years later exactly. 60 years later and so it's it changes um, you know, I, I want to say this is an exciting book. It's, it's an exciting book. And, and that's a great thing because historians are renowned for writing really dull books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so except for the ones at this conference, uh, yeah. there is this, you, yeah. you really make it an exciting thing. And I, I was on a Pulitzer jury once a while ago and for which I read many, many, many books. But I know why yours won. I can see why yours won, so I want to let you know why it, this book won. Uh, first of all, it's broad in scope, but it's intimate in detail. Like you, you feel like you can feel the trees, you know, or you're climbing up this mountain and you see the mountain and you can smell things and the people, you know what their hearts are saying. Uh, so it's, it's broad in scope, but it's intimate in detail. It has a clear driving thesis. Oh, yes, you students out there, former students, you remember thesis statement, right? So um, she has this thesis. And part of the one, I think they're kind of two, maybe more than one, but more than two even. But one is that no country is one thing. No country is one thing. And you say it twice, actually. Mm -hmm. I was paying attention. <laughs> uh, and so that's a really interesting thing I want to ask you about in a minute. And also you talk a lot about the relationship of the United States to Cuba, which you categorize or describe as being kind of an amb ambitious colonizer mm -hmm. to a, rebellion, a rebellious would-be colonized. Mm -hmm essentially from 1776 to the present. Now, I'm, I'm taking a little liberty with dates because she says from Jefferson to Roosevelt to Reagan. All right, that's close that's, enough, that's right? So a very clear thesis. Well done. Three is a laser focus on the things that all of us think we know, but we, we're not really sure we do know. Like Castro hated the US, the US hated Castro, boom, you got the Cuban Missile Crisis, we almost all died. You know, so what happened there <laughs> and why? And she tells that story. So if some of you might think, I'm not sure I'm interested in the pre you know, the slavery era. And then, you know, she does it all beautifully. But there is that moment where it's the sort of the, uh, you know, the money, the money moment, whatever, where it's like, now I need to know. And you write it like that. So it's really, really well done, really a contribution. Um, and then the, she writes in this vivid prose that welcomes the reader in. We all know that, right? There isn't there some prose, I swear, it's like water repellent, like you just, you can't, you can't, you try it again and you never can. Foucault brings to mind Foucault. Um, but 
yours is, is really beautiful and it's very welcoming. I know you're saying, so does this woman have a question? So yes, I do. Historians often have an itch to correct something that they think either other people have ignored or that they got wrong. So was there an itch driving the book? There were many itches, I think. <laughs> I mean, there was just the itch to tell this story. So I started writing it. Um, I decided to write it shortly after Barack Obama and Raul Castro announced that there would be a shift in the relationship between the two countries. And so my assumption at the time was that maybe more Americans would be traveling to Cuba. And I felt like if more Americans were, would be traveling to Cuba, I wanted them to have a good book to read about Cuba and to read about the Cuba-US relationship. And there's other books on the history of Cuba, but they tend to be more textbooky, you know? And so I think one itch, there were so one itch was to tell the story in a way where, where the Cuban people come across as complex historical subjects, right? That Cuba is not just Fidel Castro. Uh, it wasn't just, uh, you know, Batista before him and so on, that I wanted to create a landscape that was peopled, and that was peopled by interesting characters that readers could empathize with and could, and could understand. So one was that itch, just to people the history in a way that, that some other histories before this didn't. Uh, the one other itch was to, to remind readers that, you know, they might, they might think that they're interested in Cuba only beginning in 1959, but you can't understand 1959 or the Missile Crisis or the Bay of Pigs unless you understand the relationship between these two countries going back much further. So I wanted to, I wanted to tell that history because I think it's necessary to understand uh, where we got today. So those were two of the main itches, <laughs> I, I, I suppose. Um, but there were others, you know, I wanted, yeah, I'll, I'll, leave, it there. I'll leave it there. Did you feel there was anything that you corrected? I, I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm just being too much a historian geek here, but the, that sense of, you know, people have got this part of the story wrong. Was there any of that or did you just feel like it was a story that just wasn't well known enough? It was a story that wasn't well known enough uh, but there were also mistakes in the way it had been told, both sometimes in precise details and sometimes in overarching uh, pictures. So one, for example, that I've corrected, I had corrected before in earlier work that I did on Cuba, but I felt like it needed a more public audience for, was correcting what people think they know about the Spanish-American War, right? So 1898. There's a ship in Havana Harbor called the USS Maine. It blows up. The Americans blame the Spaniards, and they intervene. They defeat Spain and Cuba. And then the US occupies Cuba. Eventually, Cuba becomes independent. It's a well-known story. My kids you know, studied it. There's, a little, there's like one paragraph on it now in history textbooks, maybe now even less. And what I think that many American readers don't understand is that that war, the Spanish-American War, which lasted just a few months, was really just the tail end of a 30-year struggle for Cuban independence. So Cubans had declared independence against Spain in 1868, in a war that lasted 10 years, then again in 1879, in a war that lasted one year, and then again in 1895. And so that war that began in 1895 was still going on when the Americans intervened. And I feel like that is just, I mean, historians know that story, but in terms of the general American public, it generally isn't known. And so there is a sense that existed at the time that the Americans went in to help a sister republic and to help it gain its independence. But Cubans see that history very differently. And so I wanted to call attention to other interpretations of that moment, which again were really important for understanding 1959, because just as in the same way in, eight, you know, in, in 1898 and 1900 and 1902, you have these American officials and American statesmen saying, we gave Cuba its independence. The U. And what, <laughs> that, I mean, that, that was literally the language that was often used, and the, the Cuba owes us a debt of gratitude is another famous statement. 
right? In 1950, there was a really famous book, well, famous for Havana, written in Cuba, and the title of this book written in Cuba was Cuba Does Not Owe Its Independence to the United States. Talk about having a thesis. The thesis there is in the, in the title, right? So Cubans saw that history very differently. When the Cuban Revolution happened in 1959, and American leaders become, begin to worry about communism and Castro's ties to communism, you have senators, you have congressmen, you have American businessmen saying, we did not give Cuba their independence so that they could become communists now. So again, this, the, the, that, that moment is so crucial at the time and has a legacy that lasts for decades. So I wanted to correct that kind of general assumption. That's one example. Yeah, that's yeah. so important, and it's such a different perspective, right? I always think of when uh, sometimes Americans will say, well, America won World War II, and the Russians will go, well, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's the Russians who mostly push, push the Nazis back to in a very important extent in any case. Um, and so there's that sense of ownership or who owns this, and of course, the Cubans own their own independence. Yeah. And yeah. I think, yeah, that's a very important part of the book. I was wondering about some of your, your research challenges, whether you, inc uh, what you might have encountered. Um, I noticed that you, you know, it's a, a book that's very broad in scope. And often, so if you're writing a book that's very broad in scope, you can't do deep uh, primary research on everything. You have to rely on a lot of, you bring a lot of books together and you supplement it with some, you know, original letters and things like that, but you, Okay, again, history geeks speak. But my point is, is that I noticed that she relied, a lot, I'd have relied a lot on secondary sources, naturally enough, given the kind of book. But I was wondering if you were either welcome into or excluded from Cuban archives. I have a tiny story here. I was interested once in writing a book on Cuba about what were called the Venceremos Brigades. Is there even one person in the audience who's ever heard of that? Thank you, friend. <laughs> Singular. Uh, so these were a group of young uh, American college students in the late 60s and early 70s who went to Cuba idealistically to help Cubans cut their sugar cane. They wanted to express solidarity with the Cuban Revolution. I tried to do some research on it. I was told by the Cuban archivists I had to ask the permission of the Venceremos Brigades, which were 50 years ago. So I found out that they still are some people kicking around, and they said, well, um, we'd have to be able to approve your book afterwards. We could give you permission, but you'd have to be able to submit your book to us. And I said, well, I, I just, I can't do that. And so I kind of knew the conversation had come to an end, and the woman said, well, our Cuban friends just don't understand why we're so paranoid, and they don't know what it's like to live in a country where you have to watch what you say. This American told me. And so I thought, OK, well, I guess we're not. <laughs> That's the end of that book. So getting into Cuban archives, did you, were you able to? Did you try? Was that something you wanted to do? Was it not even necessary given the scope? Yeah, so I mean, the first time I went to an archive in Cuba was 1990. And I've been going to Cuban archives for whatever that is, 30-something years. I was, is the mic working? It was, and then it went out for a second. Just keep yelling. Hello? Out. Yes. Anyway, I was there in November and December and was working again in the Cuban archives. Something that has helped is that when I started working in those archives, I was doing work on the 19th century. So most of my archival work in Cuba has pertained to the 18th and 19th century. And because I've been doing it for over 30 years, the archivists know me, the historians know me, they know I'm serious, so occasionally I get to look at things on the 20th century. Um, no one has asked to approve anything, uh, and I wouldn't, just like you did, you would not give anyone that power. Um, but really for this book, it wasn't so much, I mean, I relied on secondary sources, but the, the, I would say that the main, for the 19th century parts, I relied on research I had done before. And then for the 20th century parts, there's just an enormous amount of, of what we call printed primary sources, and now they're online. So there has been so much declassified on episodes like the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis, and even the beginning of the revolution itself, that you know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of primary sources that are really rich. And, and actually, there's a lot of Cuban material in American archives too, so um, yeah. And I like archival work much more than the secondary source work, yeah. It's an oddity um, that there is a lot of material in American archives from countries which, whose own archives are closed. I say this partly because I, I did some work on that re uh, 
area. And uh, it's just this strange thing. People come to the United States to find about, out about their country because the U.S. will declassify documents right. and other countries don't have routine declassification. Yeah. Even, even Cuban, yeah. you know, I've tr I tried when writing about things like the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis because so many of the books are uh, U.S. books. I, I specifically sought out Cuban books and most of the sources they used were U.S. declassified documents. So crazy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Just checking on that. Um, do you think there's, there's anything that we have yet to know there for since we can't, yes, we can get our, we can get things that the U.S. had from there, but we can't get that depository of the original, from the original country. Is there stuff you think that we still don't know yet? Oh, there's a million things we don't know. I mean, just I mean, where to, where to begin? Like, what, I think that one of the things that makes the Cuban Revolution most interesting is that when it was fighting to come to power, it was not a communist revolution. Actually, the Communist Party didn't even support Fidel Castro's movement till just a few months before it succeeded, right? So it was a movement comprised of many different kinds of people. Uh, including very, you know, important student activists who were um, anti-Batista, they were revolutionary, they were progressive, they were also anti-communist, right? But within three short years, less than three, three years, well, about three years, the revolution is avowedly socialist. And eventually there's one party, which is the Communist Party. So I think those first three years are just fascinating. How did that happen day to day? You know, how was it that that transformation occurred? What did it feel like to be someone, you know, watching the news or going to your neighbor's house to hear Fidel speak? How did you come to believe that you would support a socialist revolution when it hadn't even been that shortly before? And when most Cubans did not identify, the, the Socialist Party in Cuba was a tiny party. So how did that happen? So I still think that that there's still a lot more original primary source work to, to do with that. So kind of like the, 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 the daily history of that early moment, I think is really important and fascinating and, and there's much more to be done there. But there's, it's also true for many other, many other subjects. This Cuba has, for example, a very strong state security apparatus, right? They, you know, there's something called the CDRs, the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution that report on neighbors, who visits them, where are they going, what are they saying when people don't think anyone is listening. Imagine getting access to the archives of the CDRs. I mean, it would just be, I don't know, did anyone see the movie Lives of Others, right, set in, uh, in East Germany and at the end the character goes to an archive and they take out all these state security files? Like that, that that's my fantasy for Cuba, that, that you could work in those state security archives. And what a different Cuba it would be. I mean, that movie, which is a fantastic movie, the person comes out of the, you know, the GDR, East German government, and, and suddenly all the archives of that communist government are just as other things are in Germany. You open a drawer and you take it out and you can read it. But you can't do that. So Cuba would be not the Cuba it's right. been for 70 years right. or something. Like, so I'm sure there's files on me. I would love to see what they say. They cut her off the mic, yes. just saying they, they don't want her voice to be heard. Yeah. All right, so um, Mark Twain, oh, I love Mark Twain. Mark Twain said that history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme a lot. <laughs> and I, your previous book was called Freedom's Mirror, Cuba and Haiti in the Age of Revolution, so that age of the late 18th, early 19th mm -hmm. century. How it is or was the Cuban Revolution a mirror of others? I was reminded so often of the French Revolution when reading your book. What is, what is your sense of that? Yeah, when reading the part on 1959. Yeah, actually I thought about the French, I mean it, it's a very, it's a very different revolution and that it, you know, it ended up being a socialist. Some things, it was, yes. Okay. Anyway, a different revolution in that, you know, it wasn't a Republican revolution, it wasn't a liberal revolution, the Cuban as opposed to the French. But I think when you read about the French Revolution and this notion of revolutionary time, how time is accelerating, people feel like they're making history, that they're doing things for the first time, you get the same sense in Cuba in that early period. So in terms of the experience of revolution, I think there's a lot 
of overlap. And I, but in terms of mirror, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I use the phrase more in you know in that first book, which is a book on you know on the late 18th and early 19th century that compares the. I swear I'm not doing anything. <laughs> anyway, but there's a Haitian revolution that ends slavery, right? And, and it's ended by, the sla by enslaved people themselves. And when that happens in Haiti, just about 80 miles away, in Cuba, the opposite happens. And s instead of a revolution against slavery, you get the entrenchment of slavery, you get the rise of slavery, you get the rise of sugar. And so that's how I was using mirror, that sometimes, it, 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 Cuba in that moment seemed like a mirror image to Haiti. Mirror opposite. M mirror opposite, yeah. right, mirror opposite. I and I think, and, and for me, sorry, just one of the things that, that I also wanted, you were saying early, like what itches did you have? What, what did you want to correct? One other thing that I wanted to, one other itch, one other thing I wanted to correct is really to stress the centrality of, of slavery of, of Cubans of African descent in the history of Cuba, because most overall histories of Cuba, they, of course they have sections on slavery and so on, but it's not, it's not a focal point, and that's something else that I did in the book. So there's, it's a book that's a general history that pays uh, more attention to those kinds of topics compared to many textbooks. Yeah, and that was, it was really beautifully done in those sections. I guess part of what I was thinking of is just the radicalization of the French Revolution and yes, the radicalization yes. of the Cuban Revolution. We can think of other revolutions yes. which seem to start out in a, I don't, moderate is not the right word necessarily, but in a more sensible way, and then they spiral. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's a yeah. fair uh, comparison altogether, but I have to say, I was thinking of Robespierre. Oh, Fidel was thinking about Robespierre. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, what Castro's... if Robespierre hadn't been killed? You know, yeah, this could yeah. have been come Fidel. No, Fidel Castro, when he was in, in jail, um, It just, we just got worse. My apologies. It's not the CDR. It's not the CDR. It's not, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it, no, it would be the Cuban state, not the okay. CDR. I mean, not the, anyway. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Robespierre. Uh, Robespierre, when Fidel Castro was in jail, he said that the moment, the best part of revolution is when the radicals carry the day. After that, it's all downhill, he said. And then he said that Cuba needs more Robespierre's. That's a translated direct quote. So in case you don't remember who Robespierre was, who's on first, Ro Robespierre was the leader of what's called the terror in the French Revolution. So that's when they just started whacking yeah. people's heads off. And of course, one of the first things the Cuban Revolution did, to popular acclaim, which yes. by the way also happened in France, to popular Their acclaim, claim. if you've seen any of the pictures of the beheading of Louis XVI, you know, people wanted it, but yeah. it was also the leadership. Yeah. And it Tragically was a, and did it tra this. yes, yes, and it was just uh, it was a sign of things to come that you know what what would happen to the rule of law, for instance, yeah. So. You know, one of the things I also really enjoyed so much about Ada's book, and I, I do really recommend it. I think you know, dip into it if the part you know is, is big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know, all you love all of it, but the parts in the Cuban Revolution are most many Americans, as you said, that's what Americans get attracted to, but. Um, I thought that one of the interesting observations she made was she was talking a lot about the Cuban uh, revolutionaries of the 1950s, right, of which there were a number, and there were different groups, and some of them were more prominent and more effective than Castro. But Castro wins. He wins over his rivals. Yeah. And I, I'd like you to explain how you think that he did that. What was it he did that enabled him to do it, capture the moment? Well, there are several things. One is that the, the other most prominent revolutionaries were, uh, were killed. So in, on one level, he was the last one standing. But also he was just, I mean, he, he was really smart and he was adept at using the media and at using propaganda in a way that none of the others were. And he used the, the, the Cuban media, he used the American media. He was, he was wily. You know, and so he, he you know, he, F F F Fulgencio Batista leaves Cuba on the, famously, on New Year's Eve, so early the morning of January 1st, 1959. 
and the revolutionaries arrive later um, that day. Fidel doesn't arrive till January 8th because he's way in the mountains of eastern Cuba. When it happens, he comes down to Santiago. They march slowly across the whole island to popular acclaim everywhere he went. He gets to Havana on, um, on January 8th in a tank, riding in from the east. And he, the first place he goes is the presidential palace. And he goes up on the balcony, and it's one of these famous buildings with the, where presidents would always go out and address the public from the balcony. And he says, I don't like the presidential palace. It's not the people's house. Let's go to uh, Camp Colombia. Colombia was the, the main headquarters of the Cuban army. He says, it belongs to the people now. And there's kind of muttering in the balcony with the people around him. And he says to the pe to people, to the public, he says, everyone is saying that we can't do this, that the Cuban people aren't disciplined enough to move from here to Camp Columbia in an orderly fashion. Let's show them the civic mindedness of the Cuban people. So the story goes. And he comes down from the balcony and the public parts and allows him to cross. And then they march like eight miles to this camp in the outskirts of Havana in Marianao. And he speaks into the wee hours of the morning there's white doves that land on his shoulders. And at one point, he says, there are other groups, there are other revolutionary groups that have arms, but why do they need arms? We've already won. Why do, what do they need weapons to fight against the revolution? We think they should, you know, uh, they should surrender their weapons. And everyone in the public applauses and the media comes out supporting it. And like a day or two later, the other revolutionary groups give up their arms, right? Give up, not, not literally their arms, their weapons. So, uh, so in a sense, it's, it's, it's both that he was the last one standing, he's wily, he, he, manipula he can manipulate uh, others, and he can just, you know, he has what, what some would call charisma. And that, that counts for a lot sometimes. And he has this uh, uh, fix on propaganda, and I thought that was such a central insight and an interesting point of the book was that he, he knows how to hop, and he uses, interestingly, the American media. It becomes, in some ways, his strongest tool because New York Times and a bunch of, uh, and CBS, or I can't remember what, it was, NBC, yeah. one of the big uh, groups comes down and interviews him in the mountains, and he's got the beard, and he's got the hat, and he's got the cigar, and so there's this... Yeah. He's playing a part. Yeah. And at one point, you know, Herb Matthews from the New York Times famously interviews him. And then there's three in February of um, 1957. There's three articles um, on him consecutively in the New York Times. And apparently when Herbert Matthews was interviewing him, they did this thing where, like, they got new... Um, uniforms that day so that they would look good for the American journalists. And he had some of the soldiers, some of the rebels, come by at different points and say, column three is reporting that this. Column eight is report. It was their non-sequential number so that it would seem like he had more troops than he did. I mean, it was just things like, <laughs> he did things like that. Yeah, so. An actor playing a part. An actor playing a part, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, on the back of your book, you say revolutions, oh, this was Henry Louis Gates who said, revolutions breed history wars, <laughs> which, that's a joke. Uh, it means that historians then get involved in debates about the revolutions. So they breed history wars. And I mention this because I was very keen to read your book. Um, it's something, a subject in which I have a lot of interest uh, personally and uh, intellectually for a long time. And I think that often, and my interpretation would be rather different from yours in some respects. And I, I introduced that partly because I think audiences don't get, or readers often don't get, how two, interpret, how two historians ha can have different interpretations of the same event. Does that mean one's truthful and one's not truthful, right? One's distorting the facts and one's misinterpreting them, or, or somebody wins. And, and I think that, I don't think that that's right. I think you probably don't either. It's, I, I, I question this question, is, idea, is it possible to have two truthful versions, different versions, of the same story? I mean, in the same way that when people divorce, you can have two versions of the same story and both have truth in them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So um, I know you see Cuba as this diverse place, a place that's not just one country, it's multiple peoples. 
seems to me sometimes when you view the U.S., it looks monolithic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to give you one little example because you know, that's <laughs> what my job is here. Um, you know, one of the most important moments in U.S.-Cuban history is something that's called the Platt Amendment, and it's infamous. It's in 1901 after Cuba wins its independence with some help from the United mm -hmm. States. The U.S. pitches in, but Cuba's been at it a long time. Um, the U.S. then afterwards says, well, we, ha we, ha we will have the right to intervene if somebody attacks you and don't take out any foreign loans without our permission. So there are real limits placed mm -hmm. on Cuban sovereignty. So it's infamous and later is overturned by Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. The interesting thing about that is that not one Democrat in the House of Representatives or in the Senate voted for that provision and not one Republican voted against it. It was a complete and total partisan divide. So I know you think of it as, and, and maybe it's because of the scope you write mm -hmm. of it as, as sort of the culmination of this US policy mm -hmm. of decades, yeah. not centuries, to subjugate Cuba. How do we reconcile that extraordinary difference, political difference yeah. within the United States yeah, with I mean, some coherent plan? Right. Well, I mean, that's a great question. Obviously, the U.S. the U.S. is not man monolithic. There were many people in Cuba, who, I mean, in the U.S., who opposed the U.S. Interven intervention in um, in Cuba. Uh, ultimately, the people in power at that time supported the Platt. I mean, they, they supported the Platt Amendment, right? So the Cubans kept sending delegations to Washington to see if they could, you know, not have. Not, they so basically the. The U.S. kept changing what it, when it was going to leave. So when it first intervened, it intervened and said, "We will not, you know, we will not make any, you know, Cuban sovereignty resides. The sovereignty resides in the people of Cuba. We are just safeguarding it till the country is pacified." Then the country is pacified, and it says, "Okay, no, not yet. We will leave Cuba when they um, when they prove themselves capable of self-government." So they have elections that are peaceful. They draft a constitution that even the U.S. military governor in Cuba says it's a it's a it's a constitution that is you know is a result of reasoned debate and so on. Uh, there's nothing to show that the Cuban people are not capable of self-government. And then Senator Orv Orville Platt writes his amendment that limits uh, Cuban sovereignty by saying the U.S. has the right of intervention. For, to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit, or it doesn't say pursuit of happening, life, life, uh, life, liberty. Uh, it says that Cuba cannot enter into a treaty uh, with any foreign, with any third government, right? So Cuba doesn't have the sovereign power to make treaties with other governments. Cuba cannot incur debt from other nations. Uh, Cuba will lease land to the U.S. for what will then become eventually the Guantanamo Naval Base. So it's set really. Uh, clear limits on, on Cuban rule, and most Cubans uh, in the you know in the in the government, such as it was, the members of the Cuban Constitu Constitutional Convention opposed it, and they opposed it by a lot. But they would have a vote, and it would be I'm making up these numbers because I don't remember you know 30 against and one for or something, and you know the, the Leonard Wood in consultation with Washington would say no 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 you got to do it again. And they would do it again, and it would be slightly different, but still against the Platt Amendment. And then again, and anyway, eventually, uh, Leonard Wood was told, uh, you have to communicate to the Cuban people that they would never have any other government besides a government of U.S. occupation unless they approve the Platt Amendment. So you're right, not everyone in the U.S. supported the Platt Amendment, and there were divisions over it. But in ter from a Cuban perspective, Right, it's the, it's that perspective held the day, and then shaped Cuban politics so profoundly afterwards. Because think about it: if the U.S. has the right of intervention to preserve peace, or you know, the liberty, peace, well-being, etc., that means say there's an election, and the party that loses isn't happy with the election. They just kind of rebel a little, and all of a sudden, peace is threatened. And then the U.S. comes in and puts the party that won out of power, right? It creates an incentive for this kind of distorted politics that, 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 that doesn't get the chance to really flourish and work well. So I think you're right. Of course, there's no unanimous U.S. position. 
but there is a U.S. position that carries the day in that moment that is, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And a little tiny other wrinkle on that. It was the Democrats who wanted to intervene in Cuba. Republicans did not. But when it was kind of pushed and finally that happened, then Republicans basically said, well, now we're going to do it our way. Yeah. And so it's this interesting, it's a complex scenario. Like and all history. It's called history. Yeah. It's messy. Um, and so the other thing about that is I just think it's so interesting because I think that Americans did saw themselves as mm -hmm. intending to help. Yes. And the Cubans took that as and experienced it as. Yeah intention to subjugate yeah and so I think not even all of them in the beginning all the time yeah right you know sure. even there there's divisions but then uh, you know and some yeah. of them it's like god they've been fighting against Spain for 30 years the US comes in and they have a lot of power to defeat Spain right so they, they they're they're fine with that in a sense it's what happens is that as t as the months go on as you know, the U.S. wins the war and then they don't leave. They celebrate the defeat of Spain, but they don't let the Cuban rebel army come into the cities to celebrate with them, right? They leave, the Cu they leave Cuba out of the signing of the peace treaty, right? It's as things go on that there's that s deep suspicion and resentment. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and understandably. Yeah. It's, just, it's just, it's an interesting yeah. tangle. Um, so the last thing I want to sort of ask, because I know we're going to run out of time uh, in just a minute, but, um, you know, it's funny. We think about Cuba and the U.S. as an opposition, right? It's kind of almost a war. And I was thinking to myself as I got to the end, I'm like, the Cubans got the mambo and we got the jerk. So, I mean, in terms of culturally. So I'm thinking the Cubans, you know, that was, it played out pretty well there. But I also <laughs> wanted to know, how did the Pulitzer... Change your life. I mean, I'm asking you as a, a fellow historian. I have a friend who won it not long ago, and everybody said, "Well, now we just got to call him PPW, Pulitzer Prize winner." You know, Fred yeah. Logaval, PPW, <laughs> PPW. So I had a, I had a former student uh, who now teaches history at Columbia University who gave me a little necklace that said PPW, but I, you know, I thought PPW. I thought, princess power writer. Like, I, it, it, it took me weeks and weeks. It just basically meant that I got a lot more email. So, that, it, I mean, no, it's been great. It's been fantastic. But the, the immediate change was suddenly just the volume of email went up. But it's great because, it, you know, it also means that more people will read the book, right? That it's a book, ultimately a book on the history of Cuba. I don't know how many people would have read it or paid attention, but it wins the, the Pulitzer because it's about the relationship with the U.S. and suddenly a lot of people are reading it. And so I think that's the biggest change and the most important. And, and can I just say one more thing? Because, you know, somewhat, I, we talked a lot about the 20th century and the late 19th. One of the most surprising things I found in researching this book, but you're going to have to buy the book and read it to find out why this happens, is that in 1853, the U.S., the newly elected U.S. Vice President, right, U.S. Vice President, takes his oath of office as U.S. Vice President on a Cuban sugar plantation. Okay? <laughs> so so I, I would like to say do read the book, and I think often if people think, oh, someone's got this wonderful honor, and so that, that's what the honor is about, it's, it really is, I think, for all writers, every writer at this conference, is that we want to say something, and so a prize like that alerts people, this is something to be listened to. And, and that's really what every writer wants. What does it mean to be successful as a writer? It means that people will read what you wrote. So please do read Ada Ferrer's beautiful book, An American History. Thank you. Thank you.